So, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this uh, Future of Diplomacy webinar, one of a series of uh, discussions that uh, have made possible by the uh, Office of Public and Cultural Diplomacy. It's uh, a possibility to examine foreign policy, international relations, history, technology, education, and diplomacy through conversations and insight. In these times of unprecedented change that we have been through and we're living all together, all the paradigms are changing. And so let's try to reassess everything. So this evening, we have the great opportunity of talking to His Excellency Franco Frattini. Let me remind you his, uh, briefly his uh, important uh, uh, biography. Franco Frattini is the former Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs. He served twice as uh, uh, former Italian Minister in 2002-2004 and again in 2008-2011. Uh, he served uh, from 2004 to 2008 uh, as Vice President of the European Commission and Commissioner for Justice, Freedom and Security. Today, he is the Justice and Chamber President to the Italian Supreme Administrative Court and President of Italian Society for International Organization. Uh, he is a special advisor to different governments and uh, let me also say that, that he is uh, a very brilliant mind that, that always gives us uh, the possibility to understand the world a little better. So we are more than happy to discuss with him tonight. And His Excellency, Omar Saif al Gubash, you know him. I know you know him, but let me introduce him anyway. He's the Assistant Minister of Public and Cultural Diplomacy at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation in the UAE. His Excellency served as the UAE Ambassador to France and Russian Federation, but he is the author of an acclaimed book, Letters to a Young Muslim, those of you who had not the chance to read it, please do it now because it's a great book. And established uh, uh, the Arabic Booker Prize for Fiction and the Saif Gubash Banipal Prize for the Arabic Literature Translation. His Excellency currently serves on the Board of Trustees of the International Center for the Study of Radicalization at King's College in London and the Emirates Diplomatic Academy in Abu Dhabi. So you understand that it's going to be a great conversation with this great personality. And uh, let me also uh, thank uh, the, the ambassador of uh, UAE. To Italy, Omar Al Shamsi, that made so thanks to everybody. And let's start discussing a very interesting topic future of diplomacy and uh, the, the future of cultural diplomacy, which is a part of it, which is a very important part of it. So uh, let's, uh, let's start with the Excellency Franco Frattini and uh, Mr. Frattini. Let me just ask you how much you think the bilateral relations among uh, states, among nations, have been affected by what we're going through by pandemic and uh, everything that has been connected to pandemic? Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, very interesting video conference on so uh, important topic. I'm very happy to see uh, once again Minister Kobash, uh, whom we welcome in Rome uh, some time ago. And of course, I have, I would say, the frequency of, of personal relationship with the uh, highest authorities in the United Arab Emirates, particularly His Highness, my old friend, Sheikh Abdallah bin Zayed. We have been working together for so many years that we keep a very solid personal friendship and we have opportunities to exchange uh, points of view that very often coincide. Uh, that said, uh, it is clear that the uh, spread of the virus across the world uh, did not create a new situation of crisis except the crisis uh, of the virus itself and its impact on economy, but it had a real serious impact on the a traditional idea of globalization. Globalization of economy, globalization of relations, 
between states, uh, international community, supranational organizations, and of course, it had a serious impact, and this has to do with diplomacy, with human relations, because uh, human relations, no doubt, have, have, a have a role, which is, in my view, a key role in keeping and strengthening diplomatic cooperation. We used to say, for example, that Italian diplomacy has some potentialities to understand much better than other states in Europe, Middle East, Mediterranean, the countries in the Gulf, given our historical traditions, historical culture, and historical ties. But this is strengthened also because of personal use of meetings, frequent meetings, frequent visits. I've been visiting Abu Dhabi and Dubai so many times during my institutional career, and not only United Arab Emirates, but many of the countries in the broader Middle East, in the Northern Africa. Now, the first impact has been the reduction, if not the impossibility of having personal relations. I have no doubts. When you look at your interlocutor eye to eye, when you speak the same language, and we understand each other, you shake his, his or her hands, there is a relationship that will be lasting relation, much better than simply speaking by phone. This is one impact. The second impact of the virus, we saw, and I'm speaking about my Europe, my continent, unfortunately, was exacerbating, accentuating national egoisms. This was a negative element. At the very beginning of the virus, there were those who used to say, ho oh, oh, it's because of the Italian habits, it's because of the Italian use of life. We had the spread because they have no precautions, no prevention measures. Suddenly, many others realized there was the spreading of the virus across Europe and beyond Europe. But at the very beginning, we found even those European member states blocking export to Italy of health assets and supply. This was unprecedented act of egoism, while states like United Arab Emirates and others provided health assets and supply, not to replace, but to show to the rest of the world and to Europe that Italy was not alone. We will never forget those personal gestures. So egoism. We see now a very tough discussion on recovery fund in Europe on how to manage the consequences of the economic impact of the virus. There are divisions, there are group of countries against other group of countries. So the second impact was to accentuate the sense of egoism. First is my country, but this doesn't mean you have to help the other countries before the virus spread. You have to do, you have to have more cooperation, not less cooperation. So at least on these two elements, they are very visible. I want to highlight it is a serious impact requiring political vision and political leadership. Otherwise, all those impacts will be stronger and larger in the near future. Thank you so much, Minister Frattini. And uh, if I may, uh, we could also summarize that in saying that in these times, we have seen the worst and the best of many countries, okay? Correct. 
And this is exactly why I'd like to go to Minister Gobash in talking uh, this humanitarian diplomacy, because uh, it has been important for us Italians, seeing that uh, your country, the United Arab Emirates, uh, uh, were on the front line in helping the others at the beginning, even before that uh, many cases came out in the Gulf region. So first right. they decided, you decided to help out, to reach the other countries, We've seen the pictures of your help coming here to Italy. And I do think, let me talk as a media person, that mm -hmm. this is a very serious tool in terms of uh, humanitarian diplomacy, explaining to mm -hmm. people in the different countries that there are connections between human beings that are much stronger than yeah. the bilateral official relations. So, Minister Gubash, your point on this. Sure. Uh, firstly, um, Monica, thank you very much uh, for hosting and uh, for moderating today. Uh, and Your Excellency, it's great to see you again. Uh, I wish I could come and visit you in Rome. Hopefully we can do that soon. Uh, and uh, you know, you're always welcome in the Emirates. And thank you also for participating in today's discussion. Uh, humanitarian diplomacy, it's true. Uh, I think it was, um, we sent 10 tons of uh, um, personal protection uh, equipment to uh, Italy, uh, and it was, uh, you know, I don't think that it's a particularly uh, special move in the sense that it is not out of character for the Emirates uh, to do this. Uh, and, you know, it's uh, a fact that even before the Emirates was formed, uh, the um, Abu Dhabi uh, authorities were already um, spreading wealth and uh, um, donating and contributing to many, many developing countries. So it's very much in, in part of the tradition. Um, I think, you know, we've actually uh, outdone uh, the average the, or the, the, the required amount uh, globally for contributions to other countries. So it's, it's in the billions of dollars every year. Uh, Southeast Asia uh, in particular, as well as many, many sub-Saharan African countries have received uh, tremendous amounts of, of funding. Um, specifically when it came to COVID, I think we did uh, see it as an opportunity to reach out to many countries where we didn't necessarily have um, very solid relations, uh, but this was a demonstration that actually in times of need, uh, we will be there. And I think we were also in a situation of advantage because uh, at least two things. Uh, number one is that our uh, leadership um, began to take very seriously the, the virus uh, already in January. In January, there were the first official government discussions about as to what to do. Uh, that may have something to do with our relationship with the Chinese, um, who uh, clearly were ahead of, the, ahead of everybody else in uh, detecting uh, how, um, how dangerous this virus could be. Uh, in any case, we've been planning for, for some time uh, to um, take action against it. Uh, but the, the other thing is, of course, um, the Emirates as a global platform in terms of logistics, supply and trade, uh, as well as finance. And I think you, you know that the World Health Organization uses uh, the Emirates as one of its main uh, centers for the um, collection and then distribution logistically of many, many different kinds of uh, assistance to, to different countries. Um, so it's very much part of the values of the Emirates, and this was an opportunity for us to actually demonstrate it. So I think um, the latest figures I heard were a thousand tons of um, uh, equipment and uh, protective equipment uh, to 70 countries. So um, this is, again, it's another opportunity to demonstrate uh, ties that are not necessarily political or economic. Uh, and it goes along with a whole uh, other set of uh, uh, investments that we make with other countries in, in say, you know, development of renewable energy, uh, or even specifically on, on the environment and ecology. Uh, we have a conservation species fund that works in, I think it's 160 different countries, I believe, um, where we, we work with different governments to focus on, on supporting their, uh, you know, uh, species that are on the verge of uh, extinction. So there's a lot of uh, activities that we do in that field. So let me ask both of you if you think that there could be a connection between what we are talking right now, this humanitarian diplomacy, and something more established like an international cooperation and multilateralism. Meaning, do you think that these two attitudes are connected and there is room for that? Mr. Fratini. Well, um, I, I think uh, there will be a change in the perspective where we used to consider 
multilateralism and international relations after this uh, COVID-19 under at least three points of view. First, uh, on one hand, the uh, traditional idea of globalization where the markets are able to regulate themselves by themselves uh, will decline because uh, uh, globalization with no controls is leading to more poverty, more inequalities, and those who are forgotten run the risk to be even more forgotten after that crisis. So uh, this idea, the old pre-virus idea of, of multi of uh, uh, globalization will be changed also because uh, there will be, in my view, a tendency to relocalize a number of production chains. Many of the countries, including European countries, including in my country, there is an ongoing reflection on whether to change or to, I would say, get back closer to the production, to the uh, origin country, a number of production chains that are in Eastern Asia, in China, in Vietnam, because of the idea of a second wave, because of the idea of potential new problems of uh, transportation. So uh, the idea of relocalizing a number of also industrial approaches. So these two tendencies will have an impact of the idea we have in mind of multilateralism, because uh, uh, we have to consider a new idea of more effective multilateralism. Frankly speaking, after that pandemic, I hope it will finish as soon as possible, we will be, I use this expression, we will be pretending much more from the United Nations system. The International Health Organization didn't do all what uh, we would have wished for. For example, is there a good investigation about the scientific origin of the virus? Not for the moment. Is there the due attention to countries and continent that I continue to consider forgotten, especially in this moment, Africa? Who is taking care about this, the risk of spreading the virus across Africa? We see in Italy, new waves of migrants. Many of those people are I would say, suspected of infection simply because in the countries of origin or transit, there is no possibility for test. And those people are twice desperate. Once because they are desperate to escape from their country. Secondly, because they run the risk to be infected and not having the possibility to be cared in a proper way in the hospital. So for this reason, I think the impact of international relations will be more effective multilateralism. Probably it's time to address once again the reform of the United Nations system. That could be a good opportunity after the crisis. Rethink of some of the machineries that unfortunately, also in the Security Council, proved to be not so effective as we all wish for. Mr. Gobash, you see the same opportunity out there? Uh, I'd say that we uh, in the Emirates would see the same opportunity, but I'm not so sure that we are as, as optimistic as His Excellency. Um, there are all, uh, multilateralism has already been under a lot of pressure. Um, you know, we, we, we can see that there is a, a conflict that has been brewing uh, for some time between some of the major powers, the US and China, 
uh, and then you know Russia uh, uh, as well, uh, China and India. So th there's a lot of pressure that we see, and as a and as a small country, um, we don't necessarily see that you know that there's a, a major leadership role that uh, countries like we like us can can take. Um, there is also, if I could just say also on the subject of uh, globalization and pulling back industries, um, we've had an immediate kind of reaction here in the Emirates. We just declared a, a new re uh, cabinet reshuffle and government reshuffle uh, yesterday. And a number of ministries have been combined. Uh, there is a big focus on e e economic policy, economic affairs, uh, foreign trade, and digital economy. So we have actually three ministers uh, responsible for the economy, which wasn't the case before. Uh, and we've also um, seen that um, even though we in the region and the Gulf states have talked about food security, for example, for more than 20 years, uh, it has now become of critical importance because we see that many different countries who, that are producing uh, may not be so ready to export or may not be so ready, uh, may not actually be able to produce at the rates at which they were um, able in the past. Uh, so this has actually created a situation where we've become exceptionally aware of our vulnerabilities uh, and there are moves to, to tackle those uh, with a big, big focus on education and technology. So in a sense, we are being very um, bilateral in, in our approach to the world. We need to go out there and and acquire knowledge, acquire access to resources, acquire uh, technologies, and then um, it, it make these technologies indigenous. Um, but at the same time, obviously, we want the multilateral system to work as, as well as possible. Uh, will we uh, do our best to support that kind of you know, multilateral communication? Absolutely. Uh, and we're, we're very keen to do that, whether that's at the UN or the World Health Organization or any of the uh, other, other international organizations. Um, uh, if I could just say a, a little about the way in which I think uh, diplomacy has changed, uh, referring to a point that you'd made earlier, Your Excellency, um, the, the, the way in which we're interacting is no longer uh, as straightforward. Uh, and in a sense, I thought that we would actually not be able to um, develop the relationships that we, or rather nurture the relationships that we've already got in place. But I've also noticed that technology has opened up a different space. It's, there's almost something I'd call a digital intimacy in the sense that I have now um, met with uh, many, many people online that I've never met in person. And I feel a connection with them, perhaps because we're all in the same kind of situation. The virus has created a set of common experiences. Uh, we're all locked up at home. We're all looking to connect. And it has, um, it, it has I think, a, a great deal of potential. Uh, I've also noticed that in the past I would have traveled a great distance to speak to 20 people, whereas now I can travel three or four meters and connect with a thousand people online and then follow up with, you know, social media pushing a certain message. Uh, it, I think it does make things a little tougher because you're compelled to uh, do two things. You have to be interesting and you have to know how the technology operates in, in order to become something of a show. Uh, to pull people in. So it, it kind of makes me um, hesitant, but also very excited about the future. And I think that younger diplomats uh, in their 20s are going to have a fascinating time. And this is, uh, this is a, a point on which I'd like to follow up, because I do think, actually, that one of the changing factors that we can see out there in terms of future of diplomacy could really be the coming in of a new generation and also a gender approach which is changing, even in diplomacy. Am I right? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, no, no, please. What were you thinking? Uh, I saw that you were following up, so please. Yeah, yeah. Free. <laughs> but my mind went in four different directions, and I will need guidance from you. Pick up one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, look, some of our younger diplomats have reached out and they're sort of a little worried because, you know, all of a sudden, the, the whole role of diplomacy was to go out and interact with people. Um, and, you know, so I, I, I tell them it's early days, don't j jump to any conclusions. Um, and also there are a whole bunch of ways in which we can develop technologies now. I mean, on, on a basic platform, there are things that you can build up on top of that. And I don't think that you need to be in Silicon Valley or, or in South Korea or in, or in Tokyo to, to, to have to do that. I mean, I think, uh, now we're in a situation, particularly in the, in the Emirates, where we now have access to so much knowledge, uh, so much talent locally, and also the ability to bring in talent, 
that many things have become possible. So I'm looking forward to young diplomats reinventing uh, foreign, foreign policy and, and, and diplomacy. Uh, in terms of gender, actually, you know, it makes something, it, it, it has an interesting effect. Um, one, of, one of the questions we had was, there are certain countries that um, our female diplomats are a little hesitant to go to. You know, there are some you know, very macho countries uh, where, where, where things don't, don't exactly, they're not exactly welcoming to, to, to women. Uh, in, in, in the sense, uh, yeah, I, I'm not going to go in any further into that, but what um, digital diplomacy allows is for them to access this entire universe and to actually connect. So one of the questions we've been discussing in our ministry is the idea of virtual diplomats, virtual embassies, and virtual diplomacies. But we think that you know, the international law is not yet there, um, but it's certainly a subject that should be pushed quickly. Yeah, yeah I don't think so. I don't think that the international law is there. Nevertheless, uh, this new space uh, you were referring to is quite important because uh, actually it's true, we're missing something on a personal relation, but we're uh, having a new possibility in terms of uh, reaching out to many more people and in an easier yeah. way. So in some ways, we should find a way to take advantage of this, uh, of this yeah. space. But there is something that is really connecting both of you, Minister Fratini and Minister Gobash, and it's uh, this uh, passion for cultural diplomacy. And yeah. this is really something that combines both of you. I had the, the privilege of following for a long time Minister Fratini while he was in office, and I've been the witness of his passion for this. So I'm going to give him the, the possibility to explain to us a couple of things about this cultural diplomacy approach that he has uh, really uh, taken as a basis of his action for years. Mm -hmm. Mr. Fratini. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it is uh, uh, absolutely one of the keys for a diplomacy of a country to succeed. Italy, of course, is very lucky being, I would say, a cultural big power in the world. But I myself, during my two terms as Italian foreign minister, uh, some of the moments with uh, my emotion was at the highest level were the moments where I, I would say, in person, attended to cultural diplomatic events where Italy was testifying its diplomatic contribution through culture. I, I want to mention just as a title of those emotions, uh, uh, you will remember, it was my first term as a foreign minister, it was 2004, in very difficult times, with uh, Iran and relations between Iran, Europe, and Italy. There was this terrible earthquake destroying the famous city yeah. of Qom. Italy sent immediately experts to restore this beautiful city, which is one of the patrimony of the humanity. And I, I remember as well during Ahmadinejad regime, terrible regime under political, diplomatic point of view, we sent our expert to restore the tomb of Cerces, the emperor that they consider like Italian Rome and the Coliseum. And we sent our expert to show, I would say, solidarity. And I remember as well that during the tragedy of Aleppo and Palmyra, Italy kept archaeological Italian missions there. They didn't escape. Two were killed, two archaeologists, but they didn't leave this mission where the patrimony of Aleppo is preserved. So in all those experiences, like uh, in Iraq, during the war, Italy was one of the countries participating to the international missions, but we had the mission also to recuperate the patrimony devastated by Saddam militias of the, I would say, a, a traditional Assyro-Babylonese era, 
3,000 years ago. And when I myself reopened the Museum of Baghdad, it was one of the most emotional moments in my career because uh, in those countries, we have been uh, having diplomatic relations, security relations, but what makes the difference was in those cases, cultural diplomacy. And what we are doing also in Libya to preserve leptismania, to preserve Cartagena, those are the messages Italy wants to send to those countries where we have a lot of problems, except diplomatic relations. And where Italy launched and succeeded the idea of blue helmets for culture. This was one of the yeah. most important achievements in the recent past of United Nations. Now we have blue helmets having the responsibility to preserve all the patrimony under threat, like in the case of Daesh in the south of Syria, or the risk of Daesh penetrating in Derna or in Sirte and destroying uh, for example, leptismania, and all those are there to preserve culture. So now culture is a recognized key component for diplomacy. Thank you so very much. Mr. Gobasha. you strongly believe in these kind of tools, even in very hard times and challenging times like those we're going through right now. Um, it's interesting to think about the way in which we look at culture in, uh, in the Gulf states as a whole, but uh, specifically in the Emirates. Uh, and I think we might have a slightly different approach. Um, if you uh, travel through the Emirates, you're unlikely to see, you know, Roman remains and beautiful structures and, uh, and temples and palaces uh, and, and so on, but you might find in, in Western Europe. Um, you know, we, we really did have a very, very poor and tough uh, uh, life in the region for, you know, uh, thousands of years. And it's only in the last few decades that we've seen wealth. And a few days ago, I was actually um, in the desert uh, with some of the people that you know, uh, Your Excellency. And I spent 10 days there. And it was fascinating because you begin to understand uh, the history of the people who lived in the desert. You know, I'm, I'm a generation that was born in a city and, and was always, you know, post-oil, essentially. Uh, and it was very interesting to see the uh, the amount of detail, but you, you could look at the desert and see, I mean, uh, nothing. And then if you actually look at the language and the way in which the older Bedouin described things, there are so many different shades, so many different gradations, so many different uh, ways in which they observe the, the day passing, um, that I began to realize that actually, uh, if our, even if our culture is not necessarily physical objects and artifacts, it is a culture of, of immense uh, complexity in terms of observation, personal relations, uh, the way in which respect and honor and survival all come together. And it would be very interesting to now maybe analyze that um, uh, from, from our perspective in the 21st century and say, demonstrate that or, or put it into a, a format that will allow not just foreigners and outsiders to see and understand the depths that we are capable of, but also our younger generations who are, again, growing up in a globalized, consumer-oriented society. Uh, so that, that in itself is very exciting. There's another aspect, which is um, the culture of changing mentalities. There are a lot of stereotypes about the Arab world, the Gulf states, and about the Emirates. And these stereotypes, I mean, have been, for a very long time, they've been simply offensive. Um, but we've never really had an opportunity or, or an ability to respond to them. And the way in which I think you respond to stereotypes is not by uh, speaking back, but it is by demonstrating uh, what it is that we're actually creating. So it's a culture of, of modernity and the past. It's a, it's a culture that our young generation is interacting with an older generation, demanding questions, uh, demanding um, uh, kind of a recognition of a changing identity, an identity that is no longer linked to you know, the, the, ter the, the territory, but it's a, it's, a, it's a way of being. So we now talk about being an Emirati as a, as an, as a spirit. Um, now, I don't want to get too uh, uh, emotional about it, but it is very interesting because, you know, many, there are many Emiratis who are actually are now of mixed blood. Um, so uh, they, will, they, will be, they will either have a mother or a father from different countries. And I think 
it, that in itself is having a massive influence on the way in which we communicate with each other and the rest of the world. It, it allows us to connect better with people abroad, and it then kind of creates a, a, a wider uh, sense of what it means to be a Marathi. Uh, so this allows us in a way also to connect globally through trade, through, uh, through culture, through the, uh, all, kind, all manner of economic uh, activity. Um, and, and that's what's exciting. We, we, don't, sit, we don't have pyramids and, and, we, and we don't have you know, these uh, ancient structures, yeah. which forces us really to think about what is, it, what is our culture today? And how do we then demonstrate that? Now, yeah. I mean, there are a few ways in which we're doing it. If, um, just do a couple more minutes. Um, there are the traditional manners in which we demonstrate our culture and each Emirate has its own cultural department and there are the poetry contests. There's a focus on, you know, sort of a, uh, or wildlife and the husbandry and camels and so on. Um, but then there is the, the international platforms that are also uh, are very much a part of the Emirates. So you know that we have the Louvre here uh, and we, we're building the Guggenheim. And these are fundamental aspects of the way in which we now look at the world. We, we, we recognize that we are of the same human race as everybody else. And we recognize that we share in this common humanity. And these museums are these are reference points for us and for others to know that we actually all engage in the same type of, of activity and the same type of pursuit. Um, and so it, these are not uh, objects of, of, of just of, of demonstration, but they are actually objects that force us to think uh, and to recognize our, our commonalities. Yeah. Monica, in, in, if I may intervene, because yeah. uh, the, the minister mentioned some points that not only I share completely, but I can testify myself during one of my experiences in Abu Dhabi. Once Foreign Minister Sheikh Abdallah introduced me to the school of Imams, and uh -huh. I met some of the young Imams that were educated to tolerance, mutual respect, mutual understanding, and one of those young imams told me those who kill in the name of god are not believers are blasphemic he used mm -hmm. the same words pope francis uses <laughs> many years ago, later in the mess together with the, the imam of al-azhar in abu dhabi during that mess pope francis said who is killing in the name of god is not a good believer I yeah. got in mind what the young imam had told me years before. This is exactly yeah. the confirmation of what the minister just said. Thank you so, so much. important, yeah. so important, minister. And so important even what you just said about uh, this sense of awareness, of sharing a different culture that has a lot of meanings and a lot of things to say despite the monuments and despite what you can see. Maybe it's just because, you know, I shared your passion for the desert and I spent such a long time in my life in the desert, but I took notes when you said you can look at the desert and see nothing because that's a key. <laughs> That's an attitude. You can, yeah. you can live in the world and see nothing because you just get the mainstream or you can be in the world and have a new awareness. And I do think that what your country and your culture could give us as a combination is exactly this capacity of going through reality. So thanks so much for this passage. But Thank let me much. just go back to politics for a second because having Minister Fratini here, <laughs> I want to take him back to <laughs> politics and Italy and the role in the Mediterranean and so many things that uh, he has been through for a long time. So let me ask you, Mr. Frattini, do you think there is still room for the role of Italy out there or not? Well, uh, my, my mind says there is a room. Uh, unfortunately, many facts are saying the opposite. We have been uh, wasting a lot of time. We made enormously big mistake, uh, mistakes as Italy, as a Western coalition, as Europe, immediately after, for example, uh, the fall of Gaddafi regime by saying, okay, now we leave you to your destiny. We withdraw 
is up to you to build your destiny. How is this possible after 30 years of dictatorship? And what is happening now is the real risk of partition of Libya in two permanent spheres of influence. And unfortunately, many of those who are pursuing terrorist action are practically free to move. Unfortunately, Europe has been during the years completely absent. We, Italy, paid the price to be left alone vis-a-vis -vis immigration crisis, so we know perfectly why the division between the northern and the south of Europe matter, because uh, many of the northern members of Europe say, okay, it's not our problem. They realize it is also their problem. It's not the problem of Sicily, of Malta, or the south of Italy. Italy did not as much as it should have done to prevent many of the factors of crisis. In Libya, we used to have a leverage, historical leverage, human leverage, economic leverage in the field of energy. Unfortunately, we left things to go to the point that now, I, I'm not so extremist and brutal, I see the concrete possibility of a war. Because uh, if an accident occurs, Egypt will react. If Egypt will be under aggression of the Turkish forces that are in the Tripoli camp, Tripoli and of course the surrounding of Tripoli and the west of Libya, if Egypt will be threatened and attacked, Egypt will react. And unfortunately, I cannot predict the future. It's difficult that other Arab countries will not be supporting Egypt. So there is a concrete risk of escalation where Italy should have played a, a better and more balanced role. We have to recognize, I love my country. I say always, my country is my country, but we have honestly to recognize we gave the impression is not only the impression one day to support Prime Minister Al Siraji, who no doubt is extremely weak as a political leadership, frankly speaking, we have to recognize. The other day, we support General Haftar. This is not a possibility. You will remember our Prime Minister receiving one day General Haftar, the day after Prime Minister Siraji creating also some incident. But frankly speaking, our uh, partners in Europe are ready to replace Italy in the region. France, first of all, we are brothers with France. But every country is looking at the national interest. And national interest of Italy is to try to guarantee, I would say, reconciliation. I hope that the United Arab Emirates that have a very good leverage together with Russia and Egypt will be able to guarantee ceasefire and to keep under control the situation. Unfortunately, I see in Tripoli those who would like the status quo. What is status quo? Is partition of Libya in two. By history, Libya has been divided. Those who like the status quo like, in my view, the worst possible situation for Libyans. So my hope is that Italy could, having excellent relations with Moscow, with Abu Dhabi, with Cairo, despite the issue of Mr. Regeni, even with Ankara, we have no problems to speak to the ones and to the others. Italy could have a role. There could be a room for Italy. Unfortunately, the government is somehow distracted by recovery fund, 
uh, economic impact of the virus. What happened in 2012 after Gaddafi regime? There was economic crisis. America decided to withdraw, and suddenly we decided to withdraw our Libyan friends to their destiny. Was it a good decision? It was a terribly bad decision. You will know, Minister, immediately after the fall of regime, it was October 2011, myself, Sheikh Abdallah, the uh, King of Jordan, France, UK, we were forming a contact group to keep under control the situation post Gaddafi. The group was immediately dissolved in 2012, and now these are the consequences. Mr. Goberto, we'll see and do you share this vision about the possibilities that Italy can still play a role in this uh, scenario? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, we recognize that Italy has a, a long historical relationship with uh, Libya. Um, I think well, one of our, our driving concerns at the moment is um, for really the foreign intervention uh, into uh, Libya. Um, and uh, if you look at all of the files right across the, the, the board in the Arab world, um, there is a, really a great desire, um, more than a desire, it's a, a, a compulsion to return the Arab world to the Arabs. And uh, that, I think, is, has become very much in the forefront of, of people's minds in, in the region. Um, also, when you look at Libya, I, I often think of the British philosopher Hobbes and his Leviathan, um, that, you know, without order and security, life is, is uh, nasty, brutish, and short. Uh, and it uh, really, really uh, makes sense in, in, in the case of Libya. I remember there was a British minister who was, who was very much in favor of the action in Libya, uh, because it was the right thing to do. And a year after uh, the fall of Gaddafi, he was, I think it was a couple of years after the fall of Gaddafi, he was asked, pointedly, uh, how do you feel now? And he said, uh, from the safety of London, it was still the right thing to do. It was the moral thing to do, um, which is, which uh, to me, I mean, personally, is a bit surprising because there, there, there are moral consequences that are immediate and then there are moral consequences that are long-term. And I think we're now seeing the long-term uh, consequences um, uh, ethically of, of what, what happened. Um, it's, it's true that uh, all, all these, all the players in Libya have very good relationships with pretty much everybody except for one party. So um, everybody has at least one party that they don't get on with. Um, but I also think that there is the problem of uh, political, ex ex what we would see as extremist Islam. Um, and we are very, very aware of the um, great destruction that could be wrought right across the Arab world if uh, the representatives of uh, extremist Islam uh, acquire natural resources that would, uh, would fund them for the next uh, 100 years. Um, so we, you know, we, we are far from Libya, but we believe that we are also very much involved in this uh, question and that it concerns us directly because um, we're talking about, again, culture, mentality, uh, and the spread of bad ideas. We don't want bad ideas to have funding behind it. So there are so many questions even from the audience. Maybe I get one for Mr. Frattini and then I leave you, Mr. Gubash, the one minute conclusion, okay? Sure, sure. Because there is one specific question out here and it's the first one by uh, Adil Alfarra who says, Mr. Frattini, do you think that the results of this pandemic is risking splits of the EU in a place in Jane? Basically, uh, is the uh, EU unity in danger or not, European Union will uh, resist even those tensions and those egoism that you were mentioning at the beginning? Well, uh, when we are facing a, a global problem, it is uh, the good solution depends on leadership. Uh, all will depend on the leadership capacity of European head of state or government to manage the crisis and to find now, not in 2021, the right response. I feel reassured by the very good beginning of the German presidency 
of EU, not only because uh, uh, Germany has a German president of European Commission, but because uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel, she's playing probably her last term and her last occasion of chairing the rotating EU presidency. I feel reassured, but I feel not reassured by the insistence of those that we used to call the frugals that don't understand at all that what is the problem of Italy, Spain, France now can be tomorrow their problem. The same applied to immigration, their opposition to have a united a European migration policy. Unfortunately, we failed so far. So my answer is yes, you, Europe will be united if there will be a leadership strong enough to say, guys, it's not time for division, it's time for cooperation. Otherwise, Europe will be nothing on international scene. Even Germany, the biggest European country compared to India or to United States or to China will count roughly zero. Only Europe can play a role if united. So it is our common interest, including the interest of Sweden, of the Netherlands and those who are reluctant so far. But in this sense, uh, you see uh, Europe as weakened by all these tensions in this yeah, moment, it is. or are you still confident? Yeah, Europe is, is weakening now because uh, we show to the rest of the world that some local egoisms, think about the group of Visegrad, they play for their national interest. I can understand. But where we're facing a global pandemic like COVID, we should be united. Otherwise, we'll be all weaker. All will be weaker. Mr. Gobash, how do you see those tensions in Europe? Which is the impact on your side? How do you look at that? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I, speaking to Italians, Machiavelli comes to mind immediately. So, um, <laughs> uh, uh, we we have you know, very good relations with uh, all European countries. I'm, I'm glad to say. Um, it, uh, I, I, gosh, you you really got me there. Uh, it's it's fascinating to observe what uh, a united Europe looks like, and uh, you know, for the Arab world, very often uh, we we've had this whole idea of Arab unity, and for for decades people have pointed at the European Union as an example that we should follow. Uh, I'm not so sure that that's appropriate. Um, uh, we in the Emirates also have, uh, you know, united um, uh, ourselves into to the United Arab Emirates. Um, and our federal system is flexible, respectful, and productive. So um, maybe... So maybe you give me we... some suggestion out there. <laughs> 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 so, since you just said that technology is opening new spaces, I'm just going to ask both of yeah. you a tweet on uh, our title, on our headlines. So... Uh, which is your last thought in a tweet about uh, the future of diplomacy since this is the, the last of the talks uh, between September and they will uh, resume in September. So let's give a legacy to the series of talks. So, uh, Minister Fratini, your tweet on the future of diplomacy. Uh, I think uh, this, this is the big challenge for the young diplomacy. They have to reinvent their minds to get new approaches to new challenges. This is, I think, the legacy for the future ahead. And uh, Mr. Agubash? I, I was going to say, uh, well, diplomacy is going to be on holiday until the beginning of September, um, but that's probably not the way to finish. Um, I actually think that diplomacy is much more than foreign ministries and embassies and diplomats and multilateral institutions. I think right now diplomacy fits into absolutely everybody's work. Globalized economy, uh, a need to reach out to other people, connecting is really what it is. So perhaps we should just redefine the way in which we work with each other as connecting uh, as broadly as possible. 
And again, in conclusion, let me uh, go back once again to what we were discussing about cultural diplomacy, because most of the time we consider that on one hand we have real diplomacy, which is the, one, uh, the official one, and on the other hand we have cultural diplomacy, which is okay for talks and so on and so forth. What we said, what we demonstrated is that cultural diplomacy is really one of the strongest tools that we can use to build strong relations and buildings yeah. between countries. So yeah. let's give the appointment for September. Uh, yeah. You will know which is going to be the day, the hour and everything else. And uh, thank you for this very interesting and uh, outstanding conversation. Thanks to Minister Gubash and thanks to Minister Trettini. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you very much. May I, may I say just one uh, word? Absolutely. Uh, one Monica, you're a fantastic moderator. Yeah, you're yeah. absolutely brilliant. I really enjoyed your, your moderation. Uh, and thank your excellency. You. Thank, thank, you, thank you. I know Monica for a very long time, so I can just repeat what you said. <laughs> thank you so much. And, and your excellency, thank you so much for, for agreeing to come on uh, to, to our uh, little show. Um, and it's really, really been brilliant. Um, and, and such a wonderful uh, way in which to, to finish our series. And I'd also like to thank, if you don't mind, some local politics, our ambassador in, in Rome, who is incredibly active and has to be one of the most active and engaged ambassadors that we have anywhere. Yeah. So a big thank you to him for having helped organize this as well. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you everybody for attending. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.